Today's speaker, uh, Scott Corbett, he is a and I'm changing his screen, I'm going to not touch that anymore, and I'm not even trying to fix that. Um, because he's the software developer, and I am not computer literate. He's originally from Seattle and has a passion for history and philosophy, and he recently became the secretary of Utah Valley Oasis, so that's exciting. He's part of our board now, so Scott, I'll turn the time over to you. Awesome. Well, I am really happy to be here today. My presentation today is on um, fact points. Now, for those of you who follow Gates Notes, you've probably seen this before. This is one of uh, his, this is like the book that he says is his highest recommended ever or something. He gifted it as a present to all college graduates in uh, 2018, I believe. So um, it's, you know, comes with high uh, recommendations. Um, and what it's about, what my presentation is about today, is about the same topic that the book is about, Factfulness, which is um, how to have rational optimism in a world where the news cycle is dominated by negativity. Um, and the way we do that is by actually looking at the objective data. So um, there are, like I mentioned, you know, the news cycle is dominated by um, certain biases, and not just the news cycle, but our own minds are programmed to um, recognize some things before other things that actually leads us to have a more um, negative worldview. Um, Hans Rosling, uh, the person who uh, categorized all these, um, calls them the dramatic instincts, because they're what, uh, they're basically the stories that we tell ourselves about the world that need it to appear more um, scary or dangerous than it actually is. Now the first one is um, the gap instinct. And I'm going to lead off with a question from the Gapminder um, World Survey on this. The question is, uh, where does the majority of the world population live? And I'm going to read off, there, there are three answers, three possible answers, and I'm going to um, ask you which one you think it is. So A, low-income countries, B, middle-income countries, or C, high-income countries. Now, how many think that the majority of the world's population lives in uh, C, high-income countries? Raise your hand. Probably not anybody, right? Okay. Well, you're right, they don't, okay? Um, now, how many think that they live in, the majority of the world's population lives in B, middle-income countries? Okay, we got we got a fair amount. And how many think A, um, low income countries? Okay, so I think again a fair amount. There's probably about 50-50 split between low income and middle income. So the answer is actually B. Um, the majority of the world's population lives in middle income countries, making about ten thousand dollars a year, ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year, and um, living. Yeah, th this is middle income. So here, let's take a look. Take a look at the data. So this is um, the world in 1800, okay? Now as you can see here, everybody is low income in 1800. The highest um, GDP per capita was the Netherlands at a little over 4,000 uh, per year. And the average you can see is probably around $1,000 uh, per year. Um, and there's no country with a life expectancy greater than 50 years. Now, if you move forward a little bit, you can take a look at 1965, right? So, um, it, if you look at uh, the data here, you can see there's kind of a clustering. There's maybe more countries down here than there are in the middle. And this is called the third world, right? You have China and India, um, a number of other Asian and African countries there. And then you have another clear cluster over here, that is the first world. And this is still the language that we mostly use to describe the world, right? We have the first world with standards of living like us, and the third world with standards of living like not that great. Um, but now if you move forward in time to 2018, you see the distinguish, uh, the, the clear distinction between third world and first world has kind of gone away a little bit. There are still some countries down here, right? Um, mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa, a few um, Asian countries as well. Um, but the clear majority of people are living somewhere between um, $8,000, maybe uh, $7,000 a year, 
and $16,000 a year. That's the, that's the average income for the world. And the life expectancy, you cannot find a single country that is doing as poorly on life expectancy as the Netherlands in 1800, in 1800 which was the richest country in the world. So, um, and it, uh, now if we look at some other data, like child mortality and babies per woman, you again see an even clearer distinction between the first world down here, third world up here, right? And, but when you move forward in time, that distinction really doesn't exist anymore. Almost the entire world is as good as or better than the first world in 1965 in terms of child mortality and babies per woman. Now, um, Hans Rosling, if we go back to the income, he proposes that rather than using first world and third world, which obscures the progress that the world has made, we talk about income levels. So if you go back to 1800, nearly every country in the world is in what he describes as income level one, okay? And that's, you're making basically less than $2,000 a year. When you move forward to 1965, you still have a lot of countries in income level one, but we've started, we've started to spread out. There are some that have got uh, quite a bit ahead of the pack, right? We have a fair number in level two making less than $8,000 a year. And the first world is mostly in level three, where you're making between 8,000 and about $25,000 a year. Um, and now, in 2018, um, there are very few countries in level one, a lot in level two and three, and a few have even moved up to level four. So by talking about income in uh, these different brackets, we're actually able to see that the world isn't just rich countries and poor countries and that's the way it's gonna be forever. Every country has been gradually moving through these brackets. Now, let's see. So uh, that's that is instead of, the, the way we address the gap instinct is instead of looking for the gap between the very richest and the very poorest, you look where are the majority of countries majority of people located. Now the next bias is the negativity bias. And again, to address this, I'm going to use a question from the uh, Gapminder World Survey. In the last 20 years, the proportion of world population living in extreme poverty has A, almost double, doubled, B, remained more or less the same, C, almost halved. Now, how many think that the answer is C? The proportion of the world population living in extreme poverty has almost half. Raise your hand. Okay, so we got credit for that. That's actually the correct answer. I'm just going to tell you right now. Um, I, I, I get that some of you are kind of seeing the pattern here where it's always right to go with the more optimistic answer. Um, so good on you. Good pattern recognition. Here I'm going to take an example from the very worst country that, or one of the worst countries that you can think of is Afghanistan, right? Afghanistan, you never hear, like when was the last time that you heard good news associated with Afghanistan? Yeah. Probably it's been a while. But if you look at the data, in the last 20 years, the average income that uh, you could expect in Afghanistan, GDP per capita, sorry, that's a little different than average income, should be specific, GDP per capita in Afghanistan has increased from around $800 a year, abject poverty, to nearly $2,000 a year. They're almost on to level two in that income uh, distribution that we were talking about. You didn't hear this in the news because even though it could be technically true to say 138,000 people worldwide escaped abject poverty today, that just isn't a headline, right? You can't, you, you could run that headline every single day on average, obviously, day to day is probably slightly different, but on average you could have run that headline every single day. Worldwide poverty has decreased by 138,000 people for the last 20 years, and they don't do it because that's not an attention grabbing headline. We're wired to recognize and be motivated by fear primarily, and so these dramatic improvements, you just don't look at. So instead of just seeing the down, 
The solution here is to look at where are the improvements? Would they have got attention? And if not, where can I see that data? And often it's in world statistics about things like poverty, life expectancy, so on. Now, the third dramatic instinct, I'm just going to do the first three today, um, is to see things in a straight line. Right? So, uh, I don't know if you, uh, like me, probably have heard a lot of um, fear, and, and I, I, quite frankly, it's a rational fear about overpopulation, right? Um, we all think that the world is going to um, have, or a lot of people seem to think, maybe not all, but a lot of people seem to think that the world is going to have so many people, it's going to outstrip the natural resources, um, and that there are dramatically, you know, greater numbers of children being had in, in very poor situations. Um, now, I'm going to read this question from the Gapminder survey. Um, the UN predicts that by um, the year 2100, the world population will have increased by another 4 billion people. What is the main reason? A, there will be more children. B, there will be more adults. Or C, there will be more very old people greater than, so, so the age gaps for that are children are below 15, adults are below, between 15 and 74, and very old people are 75 and older, okay? So uh, how many people think that the answer is C? The main population driver will be very old people, 75 or older, raise your hand. How many people think it's B, there will be more adults, ages 15 to 74, raise your hand. And how many people think that the main population driver will be more children? So, uh, you're right, it's actually, it's not more children. Both um, adults and very old people are going to see dramatic increases, adults slightly more so. Um, the population of adults will increase by um, two to three billion more, and then the uh, population of very old people will increase by about a billion more. Now, um, Ann Rossing actually has a great video that he made on this, which I'm just going to play for you. That's kind of quiet, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. People are probably. I don't know why my volume isn't turning up. Sorry. Um, is this. Um, can I connect it to a mic maybe or something? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to get feedback. You might do that. So I'll do a little. Or maybe I'll just. Okay. Try it in the moment. If you get feedback, I'm going to have to shut it off. Okay. Well, we'll do our best, and if not, I'll just tell you what he said. <laughs> Sorry, what? I'm not getting this tonight. Did you stop it? Uh, I did not stop it, no. So I stopped the slideshow, but oh, yeah. um, I wonder if that's why. Okay, there we go. Um, well, this is fun. Uh, uh, so I, I guess I'll just have to cover for you what he said in the video, and we're going to give up on that. Um, so basically, around the year 1800, the number of children started dramatically increasing because child mortality was dropping. But about 20 years ago, um, the number of children stopped increasing because the, uh, the um, birth per woman decreased to about uh, just over two worldwide. So there are a few countries right now where their births per woman are still quite high. Countries like the Democratic Republic of the Congo or the Central African Republic still have births per woman around five and also still have fairly high child mortality rates. But worldwide, the number of children is not increasing. Starting at around 1990, it's remained basically flat. And what that means is, uh, and, and by the way, UN po population experts predict that 100 years from now, the number of children will be exactly the same. We're still gonna have, we have two billion children aged 15 and younger right now, and 100 years from now, we will still have two billion children. Hmm. What's going to change is that worldwide life expectancy will continue increasing, and that will lead to a population increase of productive adults. 
So um, basically, I mean, w when we look at the data, what we see is that the dramatic narrative we've been fed is quite flawed. Um, and part of that is because the news knows, the news media knows what we're going to pay attention to, right? And they can only print the headlines that we're going to buy. Um, but if we go back and look at the data, we can realize that the world is actually dramatically increasing in many ways. The world is becoming more income equal. Life expectancy is increasing globally, even in the poorest countries. Life expectancy in Afghanistan right now is over 60 years, which is wild. If you think about one of the most war-torn countries on earth has a life expectancy higher than the Netherlands did, the richest country in the world in 1800, uh, nobody would have predicted that, and yet it's exactly what's happened. And what this tells us is that we're, what we're doing right now is actually working. Our current um, system of nonprofits and global trade, these things are actually leading to dramatic improvements in quality of life for almost all people. There's still things we can change to get better, um, but by realizing that the world in general is actually, um, in, even though it's, it's still bad for a lot of people, it's improving for almost everyone. That should give us great hope. Uh, and that's my presentation, and I, I'd like to open up now to questions. Hmm. Uh, okay. Um, I, I really like um, the slant of a lot of these statistics, and that's something that I generally use to make myself more optimistic about the future. Um, I wonder how do you fit uh, data about climate change into a new narrative about how to be optimistic for the future? <laughs> Thank you. That's a, that, is, that is a great question, right? Because the number one thing that people worry about is what about future risks, right? What about climate change or uh, some people worry about super intelligent AI, right? These things could be dramatically different from the challenges that we faced in the past. Um, and that, that is quite frankly like a, a very valid concern. There's no law of nature that says that uh, you know, climate change won't be catastrophic or that we will be able to stop it in time. Um, however, uh, there is actually, uh, I'm drawing on a different thinker from this one, uh, Yuval Noah Harari pointed out that um, when countries realized that they could become, that everyone within the country could become better off by embracing nationalism, they all did so. There's nothing in our genes that actually uh, pushes towards nationalism because that diversity within a single nation can be quite large. Right, and, and we're, we're programmed to really be loyal to the people that we intimately know. So the fact that nationalism was able to convince people who did not know each other, who weren't even necessarily very closely related, to work together for a common goal, gives them great hope for the future. If we continue educating people about the risks of the future, they can bond together and, and work to solve it. Now, obviously, like I said, you know, there's nothing guaranteed about this process, um, we could have, for instance, a return to uh, religious fundamentalism. That's one of the big risks that you all know Harari points out, that it could actually um, uh, destabilize the world or cause additional world problems. Um, but knowing that um, if you went back to 1965, you would have predicted that most of these poor countries would never get their stuff together, right? They would never be able to have an effective government work together to build a better society, and they did, and rich countries were able to do that as well, and as globally we made huge progress in combating diseases, that should give us hope for the future of global cooperation. Yes? So I was just kind of curious, that graph you had of, uh, I guess it was, is that what money for life expectancy in Afghanistan? Yeah, it has this it, very income, smooth, income for us. Sorry, income. Yeah. So it's this very smooth thing up until, I don't know, 1960, and then suddenly it gets really erratic. What's, what's going on? Yes, um, so prior to about 1960, we didn't have good data for Afghanistan. That's the problem. So these are, so up this point is basically historical estimates. Uh, like a bunch of historians got together and they said, we're pretty sure that around 1820, it was at this level. And we know that over the next 100 years, it definitely increased, but there is some uncertainty around what these exact values are. And obviously, that, like if we had people actually collecting data during this time, there probably would have been quite a bit of variation in there as well. 
Um, we just don't have precise enough data to say that for sure. So the other thing I'm noticing there is that if you just extrapolate the smooth curve forward, it seems to hit the current point. Like the whole you know business with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and the Taliban and all stuff seems to have been this blip that they're recovering from. Exactly. Yeah, and that's actually one of the very interesting things that you see in a lot of specific country graphs. Um, you see it in Nigeria, you see it in uh, Afghanistan, you see it in uh, yeah, quite a few countries where they will hit um, a very serious part of the road. Afghanistan is more severe than most. Um, but there will be you know, a time of trouble, something where you know, things really break down. But they're able to recover from that, go back to the baseline uh, quite quickly in most cases. Um, so these these major blips down, that's what's covered in the news. You know, when Yugoslavia breaks apart, or the Iran-Iraq war is going on, right? That is what's covered in the news. Um, and what's not covered, what's not co yeah, what's not covered is the rapid recovery from those low points back to the baseline, which happens in most countries. Yeah. I guess my next fear is I looked at the doomsday clock recently. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we're really close to midnight. So does his book address that at all? Nuclear proliferation and all the things that come into that? So he does address actually nuclear pro proliferation and he points out that most of the experts um, estimates for nuclear pro proliferation in the 60s were much worse than they are today. Hmm. So most, a lot of nuclear experts in the 60s were saying um, every country is going to feel the need to acquire nuclear weapons to defend itself. Um, and within 20 years, we should have 50 to 60 nations with nuclear weapons. And that didn't happen. So um, there are you know, a few countries right now in the, potentially in the process of gaining nuclear weapons. You, know, you have um, Iran, which is, you know, says they're doing it for power generation, and hopefully that's correct. You have North Korea, which explicitly is not doing it for power generation. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, that's actually um, much better than where the experts thought we would be 50 years ago. So um, still, yes, it is a risk. Um, the fact that nobody has dared to launch nuclear weapons at this time should be a little comforting, uh, even if not completely. Uh, and um, actually, uh, this isn't like a super comforting statistic, but even at the height of the Cold War, when the United States and USSR were at the peak of nuclear weapons. Experts estimated um, that even if we launched all our weapons at each other and targeted each other, um, around 50% of America would die in that, but 50% would survive. And around 30% of the USSR would have perished. So, um, it, so when we talk about nuclear war, we think that everybody's gonna die, but in fact, there is hope that there would be a group that survives, it would be awful. We should absolutely try to you know, stop that because <laughs> nobody thinks that nuclear war is a great thing. But the fact of the matter is that the entire world wouldn't be wiped out. Um, part of it would be very seriously damaged for a time and then the rebuilding process would start. Yes? Um, so does the author have any recommendations for how to get your information in the classes via the artist? What's his recommendation for capitalism? So um, he doesn't say stop looking at the news, right? Um, he, what he does say is while you're looking at the news, recognize these biases, right? So um, he points out just these, you know, these 10 biases, like go ahead and read the news and then ask yourself, is the positive aspect of this story ignored? You know, if there were something positive going on right here, would they just gloss over it? Um, is the um, size of this story exaggerated? You know, are they, is, is there excessive blame being cast on a specific actor? Nope. Um, the mic just died. Oh. Uh, okay. Probably the batteries. Oh yeah, batteries out. Oh uh, wait, it's back on. Okay, well I guess we'll, hopefully it lasts for a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, so yeah, so he says keep reading the news, but also read the statistics and keep in mind these specific biases that you are likely to face as you read it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Next question. Could you? It died again. Can you do the hand? Oh. Sorry. Well, I'm just going to, yeah, develop on this then. Because I think it's not a battery. Um, 
And can I use this mic? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I guess I have to be really close to make this work, right? Yeah. Colby. Yeah. And do we get to go beyond the third one? <laughs> do we get to go beyond the third one? Um, so yeah, I can explain to you. Uh, my presentation just covered this first three, but I can explain to you what these are. So um, first, the size um, instinct is uh, that things are very easily exaggerated, especially statistics, right? So you could say, for instance, um, that uh, X disease, maybe uh, like Ebola, has increased by 3,000%. That's really bad. If you started with five cases, it's a lot less bad than if you started with a thousand, right? There's a significant size between those two. So um, whenever you're looking at the news and they're quoting statistics, you need to be able to ask yourself, okay, what is the relevant size comparison for this statistic? Um, uh, uh, it ties into the idea of base rates, right? Um, there, was a, there was actually a specific medicine that I was reading about the other day that increased a specific disease by around 3,000%, decreased a different, decreased a different degree by around 50%, and on average saved lives because that other disease was so rare to start with, the base rate was so low, um, that in fact the, the, the medicine was um, on the whole doing a lot of good. Um, so, um, and then fear instinct um, goes a lot into negativity instinct. Um, basically, you're a lot more likely to hear about a terrorist than a car crash, despite the fact that a car crash is much, much more likely to kill you. Um, terrorism is almost not a threat in modern economy. The, the, the threat to terrorism is that we will over-respond to it. Um, so, uh, when we're you know, reading stories about terrorism, we should keep in mind, you know, or, or whatever, right? This is not the number one cause of death. These people are really bad, and it's really tragic in this instance. Um, but, um, I guess kind of going on, it kind of ties into the size comparison, right? What is the relevant comparison for this attack? Is it the biggest attack that's happened this year? Or is it, um, you know, the 30,000 people that died this year in automotive accidents? Um, there are ways that we can better spend our resources than targeting very, very unlikely events. Self-driving cars. <laughs> so exactly. Self-driving cars will save a lot more so lives, many lives than anti-terrorism efforts. Quite mm -hmm. frankly. Yep. Um, the general generalization instinct. Um, I actually had a graph on this um, that I took out because I just decided to focus on the first three. But um, basically it's the instinct to say all these countries are the same. We do it a lot with Africa specifically. There are nations in Africa that are in the fourth income bracket, along with the United States. There are other nations that are in the first, right? Africa is a very diverse continent. And uh, in fact, you can even see this in the way that we've started separating North Africa from the rest of Africa, where it used to be back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, you would talk about Africa as a whole. Then, North Africa, start, their income started taking off, and now we talk about Sub-Saharan Africa as a problem. East Africa's income so started taking off. So, I mean, what are we going to do next? We're going to keep partitioning Africa into smaller and smaller places to talk about the problem. The point is we need to recognize that each country is very distinct. Um, and uh, and uh, another, uh, these two instincts also tie a lot together because there's kind of a, a thought that Sub-Saharan Africa will never get its stuff together. They're always going to be poor, they have serious corruption, they have AIDS, problems with AIDS, you know, like they're just all, they're just stuck there. Um, and that actually leads us to overlook a lot of economic success stories like Kenya and Ethiopia and, uh, you know, just uh, and South Africa, which is quite integrated actually in the world economy. Um, these, these economies are doing quite well and have lots of room for investment. Um, and in fact, uh, Hans Rolfing talks about one time he was talking to a group of investment bankers and none of them would even look at an investment in Africa because th this was their perception. Their destiny is to be always poor and all African countries are facing the same problems. And that's not true. There are a billion people in Africa. Um, they have very diverse economies. Uh, the countries in Africa have very diverse economies. And uh, if you just treat everybody as the same, you're going to overlook a lot of the nuance uh, and, frankly, a lot of the good investment opportunities. Uh, Ethiopia's economy grew by almost 10% last year. 
You know, like you, if you're just treating everybody as the same and they're never going to change, you're going to miss these um, these things. Um, then this one is that there's we always look for a single tool to fix everything, right? Uh, so if we have basically if you have if what you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, he talks about he went to the um, uh, when the Ebola crisis was breaking out, he went down there to try to help out, and it seemed like every day he was getting a new app from somebody living in San Francisco who thought that their app was going to help solve Ebola. But in fact, the things that helped solve Ebola were a mix of strategies that the World Health Organization had known for a long time. Uh, and so uh, we can't treat like a single uh, tool as if it's going to address all of our problems because the reality is that our problems are quite disparate. Uh, and we need to uh, yeah, just take that into account. Blame instinct. This is the instinct to say that uh, there is one specific actor who is causing all the problems in the world stage. And we see this instinct a lot. Um, he gives the example, Hans Rosling, talks about pharma companies, right? So um, pharma invests a lot more in mildly irritating diseases in the first world than they do in diseases that will kill you in the third world, right? Or I shouldn't have used the third world. Fourth income, or the first income bracket, right? <laughs> uh, because um, the, you know, the more advanced economies uh, have a lot more to spend. And there's a temptation to blame those companies. But if you look at the structure of those companies, they will vote for the shareholders, who will actually sue them if they don't do that. And if you look at the shareholders, they're often their retirement accounts of old people who need a steady income for you know, these retired government workers or whatever. And so if you just point at this one specific actress of blame, you're probably wrong. There's probably a system, a feedback loop that's creating the issue, and you need to break the system, otherwise things are gonna change you. Um, and the last is the urgency filter. Um, he, okay, um, uh, he points to, there have been tons of news articles actually dating really back to as far as print has existed, talking about how within the next 10 years, the world is going to end and we're going to see things differently. This has never happened. The world has never ended. Um, and so there is an instinct to exaggerate. Uh, because of, In fact, because of some of these other biases, there's an instinct to exaggerate our problems and say that uh, a fix has to happen right now or we're all screwed. That is very rarely the case. It is almost always exaggerated, and there are often lots of different approaches that we can take to a problem that mitigates it over time. Um, I think my time is up, so uh, thank you so much, everyone. I really enjoyed uh, giving this presentation, and I hope you did too.